Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We really appreciate uh, your time and for joining us for the chat today. My name is Nick Pappas. I'm with the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, as you know, President Obama had a town hall meeting just recently where he took questions from the American people, and we want to continue doing just that. And with us today is the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to have a chance to visit with you a little bit about health reform, which is President Obama's number one domestic priority. Uh, the good news is House and Senate members are hard at work uh, with a comprehensive reform bill, uh, trying to uh, make sure that for the future we have a health system that works for all of us, lowers costs for families and businesses and governments, make sure that we begin to focus on health and wellness and not have the best sickness care in the world, but the best health care in the world and that we have affordable coverage for all Americans. Those are really his priorities. Uh, there's a lot of common ground in the House and Senate bill, and what we're trying to do is make sure that the process moves forward so the President can sign a comprehensive health reform bill this year. I'm glad you're tuned into the discussion, and I'd be pleased to answer some questions. If you've got some questions for me about the process or about the specifics of the bill or about health care in general. Well, that's great. Thank you so much. We're getting some of your questions now, and I want to encourage everyone who's adding comments to submit your questions, and we'll try and get to as many as we can. Um, our first question is a basic one about some sort of the timing. Secretary, it comes from Paul Phillips, who asks, quite simply, when are we going to get health care reform? <laughs> well, Paul, I wish I had a, a Ouija board and could tell you the magic date. Uh, I think more progress has been made um, this year than uh, in the last 70 on this uh, issue, and I'm confident we will have a bill this year to the President's desk. As you know, recently the Speaker and the uh, Majority Leader of the Senate announced that they're unlikely to have votes uh, before the August recess, but they will have bills before the August recess that the House and Senate members can talk about with their constituents, can work on uh, over the course of the August recess, and be ready to vote on when they return in September. Well, it's great. It's certainly something that is definitely moving fast. Um, one of the questions that obviously folks have been asking a lot about is how this is going to be paid for. And Scott Myers asks, why not go after corporate tax cheats to pay for a government paid for health care plan? Well, I think that collecting uh, taxes that are owed and due is something that uh, this administration is very um, concerned about. Uh, certainly, everybody pays their fair share. So before we raise taxes on anybody, I think collecting what's owed is, is it a critical piece of the puzzle. And I can tell you that the Justice Department and others are hard at work to make sure that's done, that the tax bills are, are paid in full by those who owe them. As you know, more than half the savings uh, talked about by both the House and Senate uh, for health reform are dollars we spend each and every day, are already in the system, are part of the $2.5 trillion that we spend each year in America, but we're spending too much money on things that we know don't work, don't make people healthier. We're overpaying for insurance products. We're overpaying for prescription drugs. We don't have competitive bidding in lots of areas where we buy equipment or buy machinery. So part of the, the pay for in the big plan proposed by the president is that the money that's currently in the system be used and redirected to uh, not only expand health coverage for all Americans, but also lower costs and focus on health and wellness. One of the issues about uh, of costs are certainly coming up, and we have a question from Heather Nider who says, I'm 38 disabled with arthritis, which I've suffered with since a teen. What differences will I see in universal health care versus the current Medicare system? Well, Heather, one of the things that's happening with the current Medicare system is it's going broke. Uh, the estimates that we got recently from the trustees, and I'm one of the trustees, but from the trustees' report is that uh, Medicare will run out of money by 2017, less than 10 years from now. That's not good for uh, disabled Americans like yourself who rely on Medicare services. It's certainly not good for those of us who are baby boomers who are looking toward Medicare uh, to make sure that we have safe and secure health insurance for our future. So. Part of comprehensive health reform is to not only lower costs uh, going forward for Medicare to extend the life of this critical program, but also help uh, those on Medicare pay for prescription drugs. Uh, right now, uh, the payment for prescription drugs runs into a wall. Uh, seniors are 
disabled Americans who use prescriptions on a regular basis have help with Medicare Part D for a portion of those drug costs, and then there's a, there's a gap. So the drug companies have come forward as part of health reform and said they're gonna fill that donut hole, uh, go lower it by about 50%, help uh, all the beneficiaries of Medicare afford their program. So there are two big wins. Uh, Medicare uh, will not only be extended into the future and be safe and secure for future generations, but drug costs for all the beneficiaries will be lowered as part of health reform. Great. Another question that we have that's obviously been on a lot of folks' minds uh, is how this will impact business. And Alex Busani asks, well, what effects will this have on small businesses? Well, Alex, I think that small business owners have the most to gain from this bill. Uh, currently, you're priced out of the marketplace. Uh, if you have a small mom and pop shop up organization, private health companies can decide if you get covered at all. Uh, if you have someone in your small shop who's got a pre-existing condition, you can be charged three or four or five times as much, or they can decide to medically underwrite somebody to say, we're not going to cover this heart condition or that condition. Uh, small business owners have no leverage to bring down costs in the marketplace, and their rates can go up dramatically. Oftentimes, our small employers are paying three times as much as a large company. You can't keep good employees if you can't get good health coverage because an employee will go down the street or across the block to work for somebody who has health benefits. So the president has proposed a plan where there'll be a bigger marketplace where small business owners can be grouped together and not only lower costs and have more choices, but change the rules of insurance companies. They will no longer be able to pick and choose who gets coverage and who doesn't. They'll no longer be able to charge exorbitant rates if someone has a pre-existing health condition or charge four or five times as much as they're older or uh, have any kind of a health situation. Also, the, there is an incentive for small business owners to offer coverage, a tax incentive that would be part of health reform because the president feels we need to strengthen the current employer-based system, not dismantle it. So health reform will be good for small businesses, make you more competitive in a global marketplace, and also help to attract the best employees. Now, one of the concerns that's been raised by a number of folks about, uh, about any sort of health care reform is whether or not they'll be able to actually get access to their doctor. And we have a question uh, that comes from Shannon Walker-Zach, who asks, will we have to wait months for a doctor's appointment? Actually, I know that's part of the scare tactics out there that um, somehow, you know, this system will have somebody standing between you and your doctor and the wait lines will get terribly long and you won't be able to get recommended procedures. Right now, private insurers often stand between policyholders and their doctors, decide if a doctor's recommendation is going to be followed, what medications can be paid for, what kind of procedures are going to be covered. Uh, I was an insurance commissioner and fought each and every day on the behalf of policyholders to try and get the insurance coverage they paid for. Uh, health reform will change those rules. Uh, it will take the authority out of the hands of private insurance companies and put it back into the hands of consumers and doctors. Uh, and in fact, I would suggest that we'll allow doctors to be doctors once again. Health technology, which is part of a new reformed health system, uh, will stop doctors from filling out forms 6,000 times and trying to get the payment from a variety of billing forms. They'll be able to actually uh, be rewarded to keep their patients healthy. Right now, we pay docs if they perform procedures or uh, order tests, but not so much to meet and consult with patients and talk about how to manage uh, health conditions or how to keep your kids healthier or how to make sure that you're taking the right medications at the right time. So I think it will not only uh, sort of empower physicians, uh, giving them the best medical research and the best technology, but also uh, maximize the, the kind of health care they can provide. One of the other questions that's been going on a fair amount that people have been talking about is the public option. Uh, and Brady Swenson asked, can you explain the benefits of the public option? Well, if you think about uh, going into a store and shopping for any kind of product, I, I think all of us recognize that um, we want choice. Uh, so you just don't want one TV on the shelf or 
one car that you can buy, but a choice of cars and TVs. And you want some competition because typically having a number of different products keeps prices lower. If there was just one car company or one manufacturer of televisions or computers, uh, the price would go up because they'd have a monopoly. Same idea in insurance, that um, in a new insurance marketplace, you would have private companies, but they would have to compete with a public option. They'd have to offer the same benefits. They'd have to have the same kind of subsidies for lower income Americans. So it's a level playing field. Uh, the public option would not get any uh, additional um, set of factors, but uh, in too many parts of the country, there the insurance company has a monopoly right now. So there's no incentive to lower costs. There's no incentive to offer new benefits. There's no incentive to be innovative. So the president believes, and I certainly support that belief, that cost and competition are good things in a marketplace. They're sort of free market principles. And in this, in a new insurance marketplace, we think it would hold down costs and offer choice to consumers. Well, when we're talking about the public option, people often look and see what models are working in what places, and Cynthia Isabel asked, why not model after something already working in the USA? Well, actually, the public option does exist throughout the country in many state health insurance programs that operate for the benefit of state employees, like my home state of Kansas. Uh, we had a public option side by side with private companies, so state employees had a choice of what benefits were best for themselves and their family, what network of doctors they wanted to um, choose. That is not only in Kansas, but in 30 states. In many states, the Children's Health Insurance Program has a public option side by side with private options in competition. In a lot of work comp markets, there is a public option side by side with private options. So this is a a strategy that is already in place in insurance marketplaces. It works very well. It hasn't driven private companies out of business. And we think it would be good for health reform for the future. Provide a little competition, or as the president said, keep the private insurers a little more honest. Now, uh, Sencio asks, Sencio Musica asks, uh, what do you say to those that say the American people don't support, to the polls that say the American people don't support health care? And how does this administration plan to get more people to rally around the health care plan? Well, actually, most of the public polls continue to say that while people may have questions about a complicated bill traveling through Congress, overwhelmingly they want the health system reform. They're worried about if they have insurance, whether they can afford it next year, next month, next year. Uh, what happens if they lose a job and they lose coverage? What happens to their kids when they graduate from college and go off their parents' plan? If you don't have coverage, uh, Americans are worried that um, their kids may fall on a playground and they won't be able to afford to go to a doctor visit or they have to go through the rooms of an uh, emergency room in a hospital in order to get to primary care, try to get their kids immunized. So we have a system that's broken. We pay more and have worse health results than any developed country on earth. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do, and I think that um, there's no question that overwhelmingly the American people know that. They have some questions about the bill in Congress, but we need folks to step up and roll up their sleeves and tell their senators and congressmen that this is a priority. They share the president's priority. That's part of what this election was about, to bring some change to this broken health care system. And the time for change is right now. Now, one of the arguments that people often talk about when they're discussing health reform, they often bring up a single-payer system. And Bob on CECO asks, what's the big argument against single-payer? Well, I think the president's concern is that uh, we don't start with a clean slate. We start with 180 million Americans who have coverage provided by their employers. And many of those folks uh, like the coverage they have, like the doctors that they deal with, think that the benefits are good for themselves and their family. So he doesn't want to dismantle the current system for Americans who are satisfied. What he wants to do is stabilize the current system, which is in jeopardy of going broke. Uh, employers are dropping coverage every day. 12,000 people a day lose their coverage in America uh, and build on that. So a single payer would really start over from scratch. And while it's supported by a lot of folks, the president feels it's better to make stronger what we have. If you have insurance you like, you get to keep it and 
provide coverage and options for people who currently can't afford uh, the great health coverage that some Americans enjoy. Well, we have only time for one more question, unfortunately, and it comes from Kim Santagati, who asks, are there going to be limits on health care for the elderly? No, Kim. I think the Medicare program, which ironically is a single-payer plan and government-run insurance, so those evil terms that people throw around uh, is what Medicare is, is an essential program. It, it has changed the lives of seniors in America since the time it was passed in 1965 and provided stable health coverage. What we're talking about in savings for Medicare is stopping the payment for procedures and practices and devices that we're either overpaying for or we know don't work, and focusing those resources on programs and payments for docs and hospitals that really make seniors better, keeping folks from returning to the hospital uh, after they get released by follow-up care, making sure that we have uh, adequate prescription drugs and, and reducing the price of those prescription drugs, making sure that more wellness care, more efforts are made to keep seniors healthier and in their homes and in their own communities for longer periods of time so they don't have to access nursing home or hospital care. So I think this will stabilize the Medicare program and make sure it's uh, financially solvent into the future. Well, we want to thank you all for participating in the chat today. Unfortunately, our time has about, uh, about wrapped up. Uh, but we do want to encourage everyone to continue to stay involved and stay informed as this debate continues. You can get more information by going to our website at www.healthreform.gov. The website has lots of reports and other information that you can access, and you can learn a lot about health reform. Again, that's www.healthreform.gov. And thanks again for participating in the chat today.